I'm not going to lie to you. I feel a little bit dumb to be like, I've never read this article. When was it written? 1989. I was three years old. How did I miss this one, okay? The Elements of Programming Style was an important and rightly influential book, but sometimes I feel its concise rules were taken as part of a cookbook approach to good style instead of a succinct expression of a philosophy they were meant to be. Okay, so this is interesting. So I don't have, I don't know this book, obviously, again. I have no idea. It's an Amazon link. I'm not going to click the Amazon link because if I click the Amazon link, I most certainly am going to be taken swiftly. Wait a second. If this was written in 1989, how is this an Amazon link? It must have been updated. This must have been updated. Uh, if the book claims that uh, variable names should be chosen meaningfully, doesn't it then follow that variable whose names are small essays on their name are even better? Isn't maximum value until overflow a better name than max val? I don't think so. Okay, I'm already really excited about this. I'm very excited, Rob Pike. I'm very, very excited about this because this is a huge thing that I feel, which is there comes a point when trying to ca trying to capture the like the semantics of how something will be used only works for so long, right? What follows is a set of short essays that collectively encourage a philosophy of clarity in programming rather than giving up than rather than giving hard rules. I don't expect you to agree with them all. Uh, there's, I almost, my, my brain almost just started going with the discord one. I don't think you'd understand. It's a girl, a real one, uh, because there are opinion and opinions change with times, but there, but they've been accumulating in my head. Not until, let's see, not, if not on paper until now for a long time and are based on a lot of experience. So I hope they help you understand how to, uh, plan the details of a program. Okay. This is exciting. Obviously Rob Pike, inventor of Golang. There's a lot of stuff. He's probably done. I mean, I think we could all respect the opinion. Uh, I have yet to see a good essay on how to plan the whole thing. But then that's partly what this course is about. I don't know if you can really, I don't, I, personal opinion, I don't think you can plan a whole project up front. You can, it's, it's more of a way to fall down a mountain is how I think of it. Uh, it's like glissading, right? Anyone glissated it ever, right? You're, you're, you're gracefully falling down a mountain. Uh, there's something about it where as you know, if you've done it enough times, you, you can do it pretty fast. But if you're not really knowing what you're doing, like it can really mess. It can be really bad. <laughs> so if you think, uh, let's see. So if you find the idiosy idiosyncratic, fine. If you disagree with them, fine. But if they make you think about what, uh, why you disagree, that's better. This is the, this is the prime time in a nutshell. Uh, under no circumstances should you program the way I say because, uh, to because I say to. The program the way you think expresses best what you're trying to accomplish in the program. And do so consistently and ruthlessly. Damn. Your comments are welcome. Okay. Issues of typography. A program is a sort of publication. It's meant to be read by the programmer, another programmer, perhaps yourself a few days, a few weeks later. Oh, that's the worst person ever to read my program because they think I'm a complete idiot every time. Every time. And lastly, a machine. The machine doesn't care how pretty the program is. If the program compiles, the machine is happy. But people do, and they should. Sometimes they care too much. Pretty printers uh, mechanically produce pretty output that accentuate irrelevant details in the program, which is as sensible as putting all the prepositions in English in bold font. <laughs> I don't think as is a preposition, but in certainly is. <laughs> I'm pretty sure as is not a preposition. Uh, anyways, let's see. In's definitely one. I always say blank the log. As the log doesn't make any sense. As the log, I don't think it is. It usually describes something about the log, right? In the log. Okay, that one. Around the log. About the log. In, right, it is like a clause. Yeah, uh, that's how I always say it in my head. Although many people think programs should look uh, like the Algo 68 report, and some systems even require you to edit programs in that style. A clean program is not made any cleaner by such presentations, as a bad program is uh, only made laughable. This is funny because in Golang, it requires explicit formatting of structs such that the semicolons and types line up. Maybe, maybe some of his opinions have changed since 1989. Just throwing it out there. 
you know, people change, right? Topo uh, typographic conventions consistently held are important to clear presentation, of course. Uh, indentation is probably the best known and most useful example. Okay, I stand corrected already. But when the ink uh, obscures the intent, topography uh, has taken over. So even if you stick with plain old typewriter-like output, be conscious of typography, uh, typographic silliness. Avoid uh, decoration. For instance, keep comments brief and banner-free reasonable say what you want to say in the program neatly and consistently then move on all right so this one i feel like is going to be exciting variable names i feel like i like this i am very excited about this ah variable names the length is not a virtue in the name clarity uh, of expression is a global variable ra rarely used may deserve a long name max physical addresses say uh an array index by the way i like see I, once again, I have no problem abbreviating. Some people hate abbreviating. I don't care. So if I'm writing, okay, this is not, obviously, this is not JavaScript. This is not uh, JavaScript. But if it was, and you had a promise, new promise, I'm fine going res reg, right? I don't, it, it doesn't add more clarity using the term resolve and reject, right? Like, there's nothing to that that makes the program more clear in my head, right? And so people, like, I've had people die on a hill about this exact one. Like, no, it must be resolve and reject. Abbreviating is the de the Lord's, the, the devil. And you're like, really? Okay. Really? So that's the case. Well, I don't know. When you say, uh, you know, uh, when you have max and some, I mean, you know, is it maximum? Is it? Are you messing up a little bit? Oh, STD? Do you mean standard deviation? Why are you not saying standard deviation? Right? I don't know. People make the weirdest, like, arguments on these things. Uh, read res as result first. It's it's resolve. You know? It's maximize? I know. Uh, an array index uh, used on every line of a loop needn't be named more elaborately than I. Agreed. There's people I have honestly got into a PR fight about with I versus IDX versus index. It's like, stop it! Stop it! A saying uh, index or element number is more t uh, to type or call upon text uh, your text editor and obscures the details of the computation. When the variable names are huge, it's harder to see what's going on. Yes. Uh, and so, again, I do the exact same thing. Pretend I have a, a thing of events, right? I am fine going const E of events, right? That's perfectly fine to me. I don't. I, I see no problem with that, and people will die on a dumb hill. It needs to be event, not e. E is confusing. How is e confusing? What world do you li live in that e is confusing? E is not confusing. Ridiculous. Uh, yeah. I mean, I would agree. I will first. I'd say that your your styling is crazy. Okay, put some spaces in there, Rob Pike. Uh. Rob Pike, this is why Golang probably has some of their stupid conventions with no spaces, I believe, between plus. That is one of the things I probably hate the most, is that they don't put spacing in between, I think, addition, if I'm not if I'm not uh, incorrect there. I hate that. Uh-oh, uh someone has cringe. Did we see some cringe going on here? Did, someone said they, they, they saw some, some cringing going on. I can't find it now. I can't find it. Do you miss university? No. Caress my ear holes? I will. Let's caress on. The problem gets worse fast with real examples. Indices are just notation, so treat them such. Pointers also require sensible notation. NP is just a mnemonic as a node pointer. If you consistently use a naming convention, which is NP means node pointer, is easily derived. Uh, more on uh, this in the next essay. Yeah, there are things I will abbreviate when I get used to them, right? Like if it's something that's frequently, uh, you know, in every single file, I, I feel like abbreviations like this, they don't bother me at all. Right? NP hard? Oh, I'm getting NP hard. You know what I mean? Uh, and as in all other aspects of readable programming, consistency is important in naming. If you call one variable max physical adders, uh, don't call its cousin lowest address. Love it. I actually love this. This is actually, this is actually great. This is great. Uh, and yes, OG is an acceptable abbreviation of original. 
Uh, finally, I prefer minimum length but maximum information names. And then let the context fill in the rest. Globals, for instance, typically have little context when they are used, so their names need to be relative evo- uh, to be relative relatively evocative. Thus, say magical f- uh, max physical addresses, not maximum physical addresses for a global name, but not but NP, not node pointer. Um, for a pointer locally defined and used. This is a large matter of taste, but taste is relevant for to clarity. Yep, that's that's fine. Uh, I eschew embedded capital letters uh, in names. Wait, what? To my pr- uh, prose-oriented uh, eyes, they are too awkward to read comfortably. Okay, Rob Pike, that's the that's the str- that is strange. I'm not gonna lie to you. I do find it much harder to read. I prefer snake case, camel case, fuck you case, or whatever this thing's called. I'm not sure what this case is called. What's the case of this thing? Uh, this is so easy to read through. It is so easy to read through. Uh, I prefer underscores. Underscores is great. No case, Linux case, pain case, <laughs> lower case. <laughs> uh, fuck you case, I think is correct. I think it is correct, Shell Sazic. I think that's the only one that works. Bone case. Uh, I have more problems with random acronyms American business tend to throw around uh, than abbreviations. There you go. Have you ever been in a company that abbreviates everything? That's way harder than in, in programming because programming, when something is used, you can tell what it is by its context. In, in in business slang, they just throw around so many of them. It's like impossible. You don't, you, there's not like, okay, I'm going to start talking about map. Map is da 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 right? Like, we don't do that. Be like, oh, yeah, something's wrong with map. And you're like, the f*** is map? Hey, Tom. Hey, genius. What's map? You know what I mean? One thing I will mention is that it's good to tooling makes the long variable names just fine. Xcode makes the Objective-C classes so easy to autocomplete. That's true, uh, but it's still a lot to read. I do agree with just the reading of things. Like, if you use a whole bunch of... um. That's painful. If you if you work at a company that abbreviates everything, it's hard. But like if you ever go into a code base that has really long names, it's also just hard to read. Everything is so big, right? Uh, it just it becomes hard. Yeah, when reading, uh, we look at the pattern of the word anyways. Exactly. Like this is a huge thing, and so it's like too big hurts. Too little hurts. There's like there's definitely a sweet spot. I really actually like I like this. I can totally agree with everything, but. But this whole lower level things. <laughs> but hey, you know, but then again, this just goes to show personal opinions weird. Can we all agree? Personal personal opinions, super strange. That's why you can't, that's like, that's just why you don't take personal opinions, okay? It's just that simple. All right. C is unusual in that it allows pointers to point to anything. Yep. That's the reason. That is the reason why C is unusual. Uh, pointers are sharp tools, and like any such tool, uh, used well can be delightfully productive, but used badly, they can do great damage. I sunk a wood chisel into my thumb a few days before writing this. <laughs> oh, yikes. Classic classic old programmer slash woodworker. Pointers have a bad reputation in academia because they are considered too dangerous, dirty somehow. Well, first off, don't listen to academia. That simple, right? Um... But I think they're a powerful notation, which means they can help us express ourselves clearly. Consider, when you have a pointer to an object, it is a name for uh, for exactly that object and no other. That sounds trivial, but let's look at the following expressions. Node, node sub i. The first points to a node. Um, the second evaluates, say, to the same node. But the second form is an expression. It's not so simple. To interpret it, we must know what node is, what i is, and what i and note are re- related by the by the probably unspecified rules of the surrounding program. I mean, I mean this is a good point. A, 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 a well-named variable, even though I don't like NP as an example. I really don't, I, I really don't like NP as an example here. Um... I, I get this, uh, but I, I think this was also written during a time that you didn't have a language server. And what I mean by that is, let's just say, like, what is rows? Do you know what rows is? Well, I know what rows is. That's what rows is, right? Like, there's something about there's 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 definitely something about naming and how you do things 
when you have the ability to 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 invoke information about it. And so I think in today's world, it would be a lot more reasonable to say the word node than it would to say NP, node pointer, something like that. You wouldn't say node PTR, right? You wouldn't say any of those things because you already you can recall that information instantaneously. Oh, this is an ill, you know, like you can look at any of those things instantaneously. So it makes kind of, you know, it, it doesn't make the same level of sense. Um, but I do agree with this. This is kind of an interesting one, which is when you use an expression, you do have to kind of work through what the expression does. Yeah, I mean, again, you got to remember that, guys, we're reading this in the in context of 1989. There's no NumPy, okay? Okay, there's no NumPy. There's no no problemo, right? Like none of this existed. Okay, the first points, okay, actually no problemo did exist at that point. Uh, and I believe Total Recall was just being made. Greatest show of all time. I like environment variables because they're all caps. Yeah. The first points to a node. The second evaluates to say something like a node. Oh, yeah. We already read that. Uh, nothing about the expression is isolation. Uh, in isolation can show that uh, I is a valid index of node. This is actually a really good point, uh, let alone the index of the element we want. If I and J are, and K are all indices into a node array, it's very easy to slip up and the compiler cannot help. This is a beautiful statement. This is a beautiful, beautiful statement. It's particularly easy to make mistakes when passing things to subroutines. A pointer to, uh, is a single thing. An array and an index must believe, uh, be believed to belong together in the receiving subroutine. I like that. I like that. I like this. Passing the thing and not a way to get the thing can be a lot more simple to reason about. An expression that evaluates to an object is inherently more subtle and error-prone than an object or an address of the other object. Correct use of pointers can simplify this code. Parent, parent link I type versus link pointer type. Agreed. If I mean, totally agreed. Because if you get a link pointer, you're only doing one null check. If you're doing this, you're technically doing two null checks, right? There's a lot of things that can all go wrong in this one situation. Or this. Oof. Oof. Got to be careful. Whenever I see this, it gets me. It gets my jimmies all sorts of like. Oof. So it's a level of careful right here. This is a level of careful. Uh, I adva advances, but the rest of the expression must stay constant. With pointers, there's only one thing to advance. Uh, typographic considerations enter here too. Stepping through structures using pointers can be much easier to read than expressions. Less ink is needed and less effort to expend by the compiler and the computer and really the person reading. Uh, and related... To is the type of the pointer that affects how it can be used correctly, which allows some helpful compile time error checking. You know, like what he's talking about, I do this all the time. I keep going back and I, I'm using uh, JavaScript as an example. But often if I have something that's like const E of events, right? And say events has some sort of message type on it. I, I would do something like, you know, type equals E dot uh, message type, right? And then you could do some sort of if type equals. I'll often do things like this because it just makes it, I like to operate on single items. I often don't like to operate on expressions. I find that it's just simpler to reason about my program when I just go like, do the thing, define the thing, define the thing, use the thing, use the thing. I don't know why, that's just me. I find that the more I try to do in a single phrase, the more I just completely f up, right? And you know, I obviously, I take this with a grain of salt. Take it with a grain of salt. Sometimes I change it up. But I technically usually try to break up small things together. Even though, like, I, I will sometimes do this as well, right? If I'm only using it once, then maybe I'll do that. That's fine, right? Like, I don't have a hard and fast rule. I just typically try to smallify things. You know what I mean? Typically. Uh, like, I, I do not like this stuff. This stuff, like, anytime I do something like that, right? So if I'm doing something like uh, let i equal zero, i has to be less than of, uh, events dot length, uh, i plus plus, because I don't use for each. I, I, I don't use for each. It, it, it slows down my program with millions of events by actual seconds, so I can't use it at all. This is strange, whatever. Uh, thank you, Copilot. Whatever you did. Uh, I will definitely do something like const uh, event equals events i. Then I would... Then I would do the whole event message uh, uh, type equals whatever. And which is also funny is that if I were to define a variable, I would most certainly give it a full name. But if I were to use a for loop, I would definitely do this. Isn't that funny? I just realized that right now. If I'm doing my own indice access, I tend to give it a more complete name. If I'm doing a for loop that's doing my own indice access, 
I do that. Yeah, four four each is is slower. It adds if you if you're doing tons of iteration, four each can actually make a dramatic impact into your program. I'm doing millions of items, so it it really starts adding up. Just like one of those weird things that happen. I don't I don't understand why I do it, but I'm okay with it. I do not like the song that's playing. Uh, what if you're doing a while and do? Well, first off, it's not called a while and do. It's first off, it's called the Lord's Loop. Okay, a do while. This is the Lord's Loop. Okay. This is the most Lord of the Lord's loop of all time. All right. Let's keep on going. Is that a joke, right? No, no. We, we did read CSS as a... Uh, for anyone that's watching on YouTube, uh, later on, press the like button, hit subscribe, and also we will have a CSS as a server. Uh, yeah. Video. It's fantastic. All right. As a rule, if you find code containing many similar uh, complex expressions that evaluate to elements of a data structure, judiciously uh, use of pointers can clear things up. Consider this. Go left. P left equals P right left. Right left. Else right equals right left right. Oh, dear. Oh, oh. Uh, would look like uh, using a compound expression for P. Sometimes it's worth temporary variable here P. Yeah, reasonable. Okay. I think I see what he's trying to say. Uh, procedure names. Procedure names should reflect what they do. Function names should reflect what they return. This was written during a day of the, the differentiation. Most people don't think of the differentiation between procedures and functions. Which is interesting. Because that's just not so, what's something, you know, that's just not something. I, when I was going to college, we still made the difference the differentiation of this right in the programming language book i had to read this was a thing you know what i mean i don't even know what a procedure is i believe if i'm not mistaken a procedure is effectively something that operates over a bunch of things and does something right some sort of side effect it does something whereas a function takes in stuff computes a value and returns it they had they always had this like a method is a function or a procedure attached to a class yeah, Pascal does have two different ones. That's when I built a when I built a uh, uh, compiler for it. Yeah, you know what I mean. All right. So if check size x is unhelpful because we can't deduce whether a check size returns true or an error on no, uh, or non error, well, that's a beautiful. So this is kind of like one of those funny backward looking things, which is in a language that gives you semantics of describing whether or not a function returns an error, you don't have to make that decision, right? You don't have to name a function in such a way that does that. Instead, it's just a part of the language. So result types are a good example of this. If valid size makes the point clear and makes the signature or it makes future mistake in using the routine less likely. For me, I can see why this is better because it says what it's trying to do versus check size. What is it checking it against, right? You don't have an idea of what it actually means. Whereas this means like, hey, there's some sort of bounds set by the program. Therefore, it's going to do something and check to whether or not it's, it's true. Uh, procedures may return something, yeah. Uh, let's see. A uh, delicate matter requiring taste and judgment, I tend to be err on the side of eliminating comments for several reasons. I almost exclusively hate hate um, comments and code. I almost exclusively hate comments and code. It's just one of the worst thing ever. Almost, ex just always. Pishley, hey, happy birthday, Pishley. I hope that you get much much fun today. Uh, first, if the code is clear and uses good type names and variable names, it should explain itself. Uh, almost exclusively, this is true until there's like a really, really bizarre piece of code. One time I wrote a piece of code that uh, operated over microseconds, uh, calculating frames coming in and creating like a, a, uh, uh, a synthetic video player. But the problem was is that every 10,000th frame or something, we'd get this weird overflow error, and that's because I wasn't considering nanoseconds. And so without the consideration of nanoseconds, I'd get these weird overflow issues. And so therefore, I actually had to put a comment being like, hey, future me, I keep track of this second thing called an overflow. And the overflow will slowly accumulate. And then once it crosses one, this means I've actually had enough nanoseconds to affect my microsecond count. Therefore, you need to have this, right? Like, give myself a little bit of reasoning why I'm doing such a bizarre thing because it's so unusual. Unless if you have deep domain knowledge on this one tiny thing, you wouldn't know about it, right? Uh, and so there you go. 
Second, comments aren't checked by the compiler, so there's no guarantee they're right, especially after the code is modified. This is the reason why I hate comments. A misleading comment can be very confusing. In fact, I would I would argue that no comments is less bad than misleading comments. Third, uh, the issue of typography, comments clutter code. Agreed. Uh, this is the worst thing about college is that they make you comment code. Like everything. And the they do the worst kind of commenting of code. They make you do something like this, where it's just like four const E of events. Uh, go over all events and sum their, uh, you know, values, right? And then you're like, you know, uh, sum plus equals E dot, uh, E dot value, right? Like that kind of stuff. Like that's just the worst kind of comment because it didn't tell me anything. Like it's, it's, it's code. It's, it's attempting to chat GPT code what this what this is doing. It's like the worst. <clears throat> but it gets you an A+. It is the worst, though. I do comment sometimes, almost uh, exclusively. Uh, I use them as an introduction to what follows. Example, explaining the use of a global variables and types. The one, So I, don't, I never do type uh, stuff anymore because, well... You don't have to with LSPs and all that. The one thing I always comment in large programs, as an introduction to an unusual or critical procedure um, or to mark off sections of a large computation. The, let's see. There is a famously bad comment style. I equals I plus one. Add one to I. Hate it. And then there's uh, then there are worse ways to do it. <laughs> If I saw this, I would recommend the person being fired. Or I'd buy them a beer. I don't know which one it would be. I don't even know which one it would be, right? Like, should this person be fired or should they get a promotion to manager? I don't even know. Sick manner, dog. I know. Now I kind of want to start doing this. Now I kind of want to do it. I kind of want to make a Vim plugin called Obnoxious Commenter where you can do a quick comment and it'll just like blow it up. Dude, don't laugh now. Wait until you see it in real life. This is true. Avoid cute typography in a comment. Avoid big blocks. Okay, I'm going to tell you, like, I can't remember the, the exact one, and I think I took a picture of it on my Facebook and posted it, but I have deactivated my Facebook years ago, and so I can't remember exactly the exact thing, and it'd be way too hard to find it. But it went a little something like this. It was just, like, some va va variable. It was, like, int x equals, and then it was just, like, a very long, long hexadecimal number. And, and, oh, like, and, and, oh, something like, uh, some variable name, var, I forget what it was. And then it said like this, we, uh, like, uh, we mod seven because of two. And I sat there and I looked at it, 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 and I could never figure out what the hell it did. Because there was no seven, or, hold on, here. Uh, let's call that thing a five and let's call this thing a four, right? There was no seven. There was no two. I didn't know what it did or why it did. It just, it just sits there floating in this way in which confuses me. There's no mod. There's an ampersand sign. Like it just, I couldn't figure it out. I could not figure it out. It had to do with radar and uh, ultra wideband and radar and how to select these buckets. And it just like, I could not figure it out. It was the worst. And that's where wrong comments are just the worst. If your code needs a comment to be understood, it would be better to rewrite it so it's easier to understand. Which brings us to, love this, I just, speak into my heart, Rob. Uh, complexity. Most programs are too complicated. That is, more complex than they need to be to solve their problems efficiently. Why? Mostly it's because of bad design. But I will skip that issue here because it's a big one. But programs are often complicated by the microscopic level, and that is something, or... Programs are often complicated at the microscopic level, and that is something I can address here. Rule one. Okay. Very excited about these rules. Rule one. You can't tell where a program is going to spend its time. Fantastic. Bottlenecks occur in surprising places, like my for each one. I saved multiple seconds by not using array dot for each, right? It's crazy. Right? Uh, so don't try to second guess and put in a speed hack until you've proven that's where the bottleneck is. That's right. Uh, two, measure. Don't tune for speed until you've measured. And even then, don't, uh, don't unless part, one part of the code overwhelms the rest. This is, so this one's kind of interesting because the hard part about this one is that there's the whole problem of hotspot optimizations. You often find yourself making something faster, but then you 
immediately hit a bottleneck or a uh, a limit of how much you can make your code faster. I think I read an article about this a, a month or two ago, but it's very interesting. Uh, rule three, fancy algorithms are slow when N is small and N is usually small. Fancy algorithms have big constants. This is true. That's why a map is almost always slower. Like, check this out. If you're in code and you go like something like this, const A equals, um, you know, a bunch of 14 items in here. Let's just pretend there's 14 items in here. And you check thousands of times. You do something like uh, includes, you know, something. I don't know, a B. And you do this thousands of times. It is still faster to use this than const A equals a new map of, uh, you know, string to number or something. String to uh, bo boolean, right? It's significantly faster, even in JavaScript, which doesn't even use an array. It is significantly faster to use the top version than the bottom version. It's crazy, right? People don't realize that fancy data structures come often at a cost. And people don't know that. But maps are constant time. And maps are constant time. All right, look at this. They're even saying it right here. Oh, yeah, let's go. All right. All right, uh, fancy, yep. Uh, until you know what N is frequently going to be, uh, is frequently going to be big, don't get fancy. Even if N does get big, use rule two first. For example, binary trees are always faster than splay trees for work, uh, uh, work a day problems. I'm not, <laughs> I don't know what a work a day problem is. And I haven't looked at the display tree in long enough that I forgot what it is. Okay, rule four. Fancy algorithms are buggier than simple uh, simple ones. Yep. And they're much harder to implement. Yep. But that's what we have libraries now for the most part. So, a, you know, a hash table is easy. A, a B tree, you know. Uh, use simple algorithms as well as simple data structures. The following data structures are a complete list for almost all practical programs. Array, linked list, hash table, binary tree. It's a good list. I would add in here that with modern programs, we use array list a lot. Kind of the in-between of linked list and array list, right? Yeah, vector. Vector, array, li uh, array list, however you want to put it. Of course, you may also uh, be prepared to collect these into compound data structures. For instance, a simple table might be implemented as a hash table containing linked list of arrays of characters. Yep. Uh, rule five, data dominates. If you've chosen the right data structures and organize things well, the algorithm will almost always be self-evident. A data structure, let's see, data structures, not algorithms, are central to programming. I love this. I love this. This is great. What is a vector? Uh, just think of it as a vector. It's, it's just an array list. It's a dynamic array. Rule six, there is no rule six. This is good. Have you read Mythical Man? I actually haven't read Mythical Man yet. Uh, I think I read bits and pieces of it, but I actually haven't read it. I should read that. Rule seven, see rule six, oof, oof. Uh, algorithms or details of algorithms can often be encoded compactly, efficiently, and expressively as data rather than, say, lots of if statements. The reason is that complexity of the job at hand, uh, if... It if it is due to a combination of independent details, can be encoded. A classic example uh, of this is a parsing table, or is parsing tables, which encodes the grammar of the programming language in a form of interpretable by a fixed, fairly simple piece of code. Finite state machines are particularly amenable, amenable to this form of attack. But almost any program that involves the parsing of some abstract sort of input into a sequence of some independent actions can be constructed profitably as a data-driven algorithm. I bet you 99 out of 100 people literally have no idea what he just said. That's my guess. My guess, most people are going to nod their head at that and go... Yeah, dude, totally. Totes my goats, bro. Uh, perhaps the most intriguing aspect of this kind of design is that the tables can sometimes be generated by another program. By the way, I really, uh, I really, really want to understand data-driven design. I've never actually done data-driven design. I've never like tried to go through it and read it in its like uh, uh, academic sense. And so that's one thing I actually do want to do. Yeah, sure, called it. Damn it, pick. Damn it, pick. 
My guess is that I have arrived to some sort of conclusion near data-driven design. And I just don't know about it. Too much D? It's just enough D to make it fun. Uh, a parser generator in the classical case. Uh, the more er er earthy example, if an operating system is driven by a set of tables that connect I.O. requests to the appropriate device drivers, the system may be configured by a program that reads the description of the particular devices connected to the machine in question and prints the corresponding tables. Absolutely. One of the reasons data-driven programs are not common, at least among beginners, is the tyranny of Pascal. Pascal. All my homies hate Pascal. Pascal, like its creator. <laughs> oh no, no, this is this is not good. This is not good. Pascal, like its creator, firmly believes in the separation of code and data. It therefore, at least in its original form, has no ability to create initialized data. Goodness gracious. This uh, flies in the face of theories of Turing and von Neumann, which define the basic principles of stored program computer. Code and data are the same. Oh, man, Lisp programmer, casual Lisp programmer coming in, or at least can be. How else do you explain how compilers work? Functional languages have similar problems with I.O. <laughs> this is why I also like, uh, this is why my functional programming journey is OCaml. Dude, this is beautiful. Function pointers. Woo! Let's go. First class functions. Another result of tyranny of Pascal is the beginners don't use function pointers. You can't have a function value variables in Pascal. Oh, I remember that. Gross. Well, I guess during this time, during this time, I was heavy into C Sharp and Java, and you couldn't have function pointers in C Sharp or Java during the 1.6 days of Java slash whatever C Sharp was, right? You just couldn't have it. Using function pointers to encode complexity has some interesting properties. The complexity is passed to the routine pointed to. Uh, the routine must obey the some standard protocol. It is let's see, it's one of the set of routines invoked identically. But beyond that, what do, let's see, what it does is its business alone. The complexity is distributed. I can see this. This is good. There's an idea of a protocol in that all functions used similarly must behave similarly. Sim similarly. That's a hard word to say. This makes uh, for easy documentation, testing growth, and even making the program run distributed over a network. The protocol can be encoded as remote procedure calls. Okay. I assume this is like, I mean, in some sense, you're almost speaking about some sort of map reduce here as well. I'll say I can argue that clear use of function pointers is the heart of object-oriented programming. Oh, shit. Oh, uh, Pick, cover your ears. We pick this ain't it, pick. I don't, I, I, here we go, here we go. Given a set of operations that you still, let's say you want to perform on data and a set of data types you want to respond to those operations, the easiest way to put the program together is a group of function pointers for each type. This is in a nutshell, defines class and method. The OO languages give you more of a coarse, prettier syntax, derived types, and so on. But conceptually, they provide little extra. Combining data-driven programs with function pointers leads to an astonishingly expressive way of working, a way that, in my experience, has often led to a pleasant surprises. Uh, even without special OO language, you can get 90% of the benefit for no extra work and more in control of the result. Okay, yeah. I cannot recommend an implementation style more highly. All the programs I have organized this way have survived comfortably after much devel uh, development, far better than those less disciplined approaches. Maybe that's it. The discipline it forces pays off handsomely in the long run. This is actually really interesting because... A good type system, like, like right now because I'm just starting OCaml... And I feel like this makes sense how functional programming has an advantage. Real functional programming, not JavaScript. We got to stop dropping. We got to stop with this whole just because you make functions, bro, does not mean you're functionally programming, bro. Right? We got to stop that. I just wish, I mean, the thing is, is this is why I hate it that I like Rust because I, I dislike Rust leadership and it makes me not want to use their language. But Rust is procedural functional programming. It is F poo. Right? It's it's like my favorite of it all. Right? I just want to be able to program in a way that's C like, but I want to have all the conveniences of functions and functional like semantics. You know what I mean? 
functional procedural OOP. Classic. That's Go. I know. So I, I, I want... The problem is Go... The problem is, is I want Go to be more complex. And the problem is that I don't want Go to be more complex. It's, it hurts. It's emotionally painful. The gopher is not cute. I want to murder the gopher, okay? The gopher... See, the thing... When you grow up in a small rural area, gophers are a sign of tyranny, okay? You don't understand, okay? If you know, you know. If you don't know, you don't know, okay? Some of us had the responsibility to go murder gophers, okay? Okay? Crabs, on the other hand, are delicious. Love a crab to come next to me. You know what I mean? They're a menace. They are a menace. See? Thank you. Somebody who understands. Gophers are a menace. They are terrible, terrible animals that you should eradicate. One simple rule. Include files should never include include files. Uh, if instead they state in the comments uh, or implicitly what the files they need to have included first. The problem of deciding which files to include is pushed over to the user, the programmer, but in many ways that is easy to handle and that by construction. So I think this is one of those things in which doesn't exist in more modern languages, right? Um, I think I see what they're trying to say, right? I, I think I see what Pike's trying to say here, which is you don't want files with a bunch of dependencies because then when you try to import them, they import a bunch of stuff and your program starts exploding. Um, I can understand this. You want your like library files to be self-contained, you know, whatever ones, but this paragraph predicts NPM dependency out. Like, that's a good point. Lately, I've been struggling with some uh, NPM dependency problems because these peer dependencies have been biting me in the ass. And it doesn't show up until runtime when I try to evoke a TypeScript program with a library that has a peer dependency that somehow is not making it through in the generated code and exploding. It's been very, very, very upsetting. So, I mean, I understand. I, I think I understand what they're talking about. Right? I understand this rule. I think Rob probably has it right. He's probably correct, but it seems impractical. That's my pro I, that's probably the problem. This might be an academic thing. Also, uh, don't do if defs. Uh, that can prevent a file from being read twice, but that's usually done wrong in practice. The if defs are uh, in the file itself, not for the file that it includes it. The result is often thousands of needless lines of code passing through a lexical analyzer, which is, in good compilers, the most expensive phase. See, like, like I said, this might be, I mean, though correct, this might not be the same thing. Right? Now we pass those thousands of line through, and we tree shake. Hey, baby, you want to shake my tree? It's a Stephen Miller song, okay? It's a Stephen Miller song, and now it's also a JavaScript concept. The name is the tree shake again. 